Okay, very good. Um, we're going to get started again uh, with our next uh, uh, lecture. Um, uh, William Carty, uh, who has just retired as the John F. McMahon Professor um, at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University, and he's taught there for 27 years. Bill has worked closely with industry during his tenure at Alfred and generated over $21 million in research funding, mostly with industrial projects or by leveraging industrial funds with New York State funding sources. He's taught ceramics engineering courses during the school year and ceramic science for artists in the summer in Alfred and other locations, along with industrial short courses. Uh, this is Bill's fifth year in participating in ACAO, having previously lectured on glaze defects, color, outdoor ceramic bodies to resist freeze-thaw cycles, and energy comparisons between terracotta and other building materials. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Bill Cardi. Well, good afternoon. Um, there was a perfect segue a few moments ago uh, where he mentioned uh, um, the energy costs associated with terracotta and environmental impact of, of that sort of thing. So uh, last year I gave something similar, but this year uh, we're going to change it up a bit because um, there were some assumptions I think that I made that were probably not valid. And so uh, the idea is I'd like to give you an idea or uh, an overview of of what happens for material production. And I think this will be uh, in, informative. So essentially, um, the question really is, what are the energy or environmental costs that are associated with manufacturing building materials? And the, the problem that we have is that the ease at which we can access these materials, you know, for example, uh, you can go down to the hardware store potentially or to a supplier and buy aluminum. Um, it seems inexpensive, it's easy to obtain. Um, and, and then that makes it appear that there is a relatively low cost associated with that. Uh, whereas if you can think about terracotta materials or ceramic materials in general, we are one of the few industries left where basically everything is done in one place. You start with a raw material, you produce a product, it goes into a box and is shipped to a consumer directly. Every piece is made basically to order. Unlike steel, for example, or aluminum or plastics, where you can buy sheets of material or forms, uh, ceramic materials are all manufactured for a specific application. So the question would be really, can we um, essentially, can we, um, excuse me, um, let's compare then the cost associated with metals, plastics, and ceramics, and then let's see what our collective perception is that ceramics are more expensive because of this need for firing and the high temperature that's required and the fact that we have to have a huge furnace to do so. <clears throat> so, that perception that energy cost for ceramics is higher is a misperception. They're actually the least energy intensive and lowest environmental impact of any of the building materials that are commonly used. And in ceramics, I mean clay for brick, clay for terracotta, roof tiles, etc. even less expensive from an energy and environmental impact perspective than say uh, cement or concrete or glass, and certainly much less energy intensive to produce than metals. Metals and plastics, uh, that production of those materials have a lot of hidden processing steps. Uh, they require immense amounts of energy and have huge environmental costs. And this recognized, a friend of mine had a bumper sticker on his car that said, Earth first, we will mine other planets later. Um, and then you've of course seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, if it's uh, not grown, it has to be mined. So all of these materials, metals, plastics, ceramics, I'll start with mining. And then there's some uh, basis or some beneficiations occur, some processing and refinement of those materials before they get used for something. And in some cases, those process and beneficiation uh, steps and refinement steps are immense and, and incredibly costly. So I put together a table actually of just an overview of energy costs required to produce materials. And I started at the top uh, with aluminum metal, um, which is by far the most energy intensive uh, material to produce. And what I'm going to do is break down how aluminum is made uh, so that you understand where those costs are generated. And if I compare those to the costs associated with making clay, it's over a hundred times greater cost to make aluminum roughly uh, than it is to make terracotta or brick or other ceramic materials. Copper and stainless steel are about a hundred. Plastics are 50 to 100. And you look at plastics at, at 50 to 100 and you say, well, how is it possible that it's that much cost 
You have exploration and production. You have crude oil that comes out of the ground, which is where we start our natural gas. That goes through a process of either catalytic cracking or some other process such as the, the reverse of that, where you build up those polymers to what you want. And then you have further refining after that. It's a very energy intensive process also. Uh, steel is uh, the least of the metals in terms of its energy, energy production costs. And um, part of that may be attributed to scale, but the other really has to do with the ability to strip oxygen from iron ore, uh, iron oxide to go to iron metal as less energy intensive than for aluminum, for example. Glass is about six times more expensive to produce from an energy perspective than terracotta or clay. Plasterboard is surprisingly expensive. You would think it's not that expensive, uh, but it's mined out of the ground uh, in the form of gypsum. It has to be decomposed to a certain extent to make plaster of Paris. Uh, and then you have to dry it after you uh, form the gypsum wallboard, for example. Uh, drying is an incredibly an energy intensive step by comparison. Cement's about two times more expensive than produce uh, clay or terracotta. Um, and, and basically our cement productions are, uh, they're huge in terms of um, volumes produced in the world, um, <clears throat> but they're also more energy intensive, but still much less energy intensive uh, than the metals. So your natural question would be, why is aluminum so expensive to produce in terms of energy? And the thing is that aluminum is remarkably plentiful. And in the Earth's crust, it is the third most common element found in the Earth's crust. It shows up in clay, it shows up in, in feldspar, and it shows up in bauxite. Um, <coughs> it's naturally formed as an oxide. It doesn't really show up in any other form. It's always in there bonded to oxygen. And that chemical bond for aluminum to oxygen is extremely strong. And the reason uh, that it takes so much energy is because you have to strip that oxygen off the aluminum. That takes an immense amount of energy. And so uh, that is the process and the problem that we're, we're, uh, we're faced with. We just take an overall view of that. Uh, we get bauxite out of the ground, not particularly plentiful. Uh, there's a number of different grades. And to make aluminum metal, you need what's called metallurgical grade bauxite. Uh, there are a number of deposits in the world. You can probably name some of them. Uh, Arkansas used to have... Um, uh, bauxite deposits that were, were mined and they're now mined out. They no longer um, are mining bauxite in Arkansas. Um, China has some, not as much as you might think. There's a lot of bauxite in China, but most of it is not metallurgical grade. So it can't be used to make metal or it's much more expensive to do so. Jamaica is a big one. Um, uh, Hungary had um, bauxite deposits, still does actually. Um, Guyana, Guyana, the northern coast of, um, of uh, South America and Australia also has bauxite deposits. If you look at the numbers here, you get, it's roughly a little less than half aluminum oxide that you get out of bauxite. And then for that amount of aluminum oxide, you get roughly half of that as aluminum metal. So for every four tons of bauxite you mine, you get about one ton of aluminum metal. But with that, uh, there's generation of carbon, aluminum fluoride uh, is used, cryolite is used to make that aluminum metal and then a lot of electricity to extract the aluminum metal from aluminum oxide. <clears throat> so before we can extract aluminum though from the mineral, okay, or from bauxite, which is a rock actually, we have to find it, we have to mine it, and we have to beneficiate it. Uh, bauxite has the highest aluminum level of any of the rocks available on the planet. Uh, it's also relatively rare by comparison. And the problem with bauxite is that it also comes with iron, typically in in the bauxite either as iron oxide or iron hydroxide, and we must separate that out. And because the bauxite is um, that, those two minerals, if you will, aluminum hydroxide is one and iron oxide is another, are so intermixed that we can't do it by some sort of mechanical separation process. We actually have to dissolve away the aluminum, and that leaves us with the, um, uh, with the iron. This is sort of a cartoon version of that, okay? It's called the Bayer process. It was developed um, in the late 19, uh, I want to say the 1930s, but I may have that incorrect. Um, and basically that process um, is an expensive process in and of itself. Bauxite comes from the mine, gets crushed into small pieces and they go into a digester. Um, that is a high temperature, high pH um, um, liquid, basically a suspension of those bauxite particles. And it literally is enough temperature and, um, and 
caustic material uh, aggressively dissolves aluminum out of that and forms then what's called a pregnant liquor uh, that goes into the next step to be precipitated. And in that process, as you extru extract the aluminum, uh, you're left with iron, which actually doesn't dissolve. And that comes out as a bauxite residue in the system. And that bauxite residue in the system actually uh, comes out and forms something called red mud. And so you get roughly one to 2.5 tons of red mud per ton of aluminum produced. Okay, that material gets separated out and it goes to a red mud lake, which I'll show you pictures of in a moment. Uh, the pregnant liquor, which is now saturated with aluminum, goes to the next step and gets precipitated out as aluminum hydroxide and uh, through uh, driving the pH back down with sulfuric acid. So then you get uh, sodium sulfate back off as a byproduct. That material comes out, gets dried out of the precipitator, it's now called aluminum hydroxide, and then it gets heat treated in a rotary kiln, a continuous kiln, to make what's called alumina or aluminum oxide. And that aluminum oxide is what goes to metal production. So the first part of this process of making aluminum is actually extracting aluminum from uh, bauxite in the form of aluminum oxide. And the next step is then to make um, uh, aluminum uh, metal. Now here are some pictures of uh, red mud lakes. <coughs> um, they're really quite nasty. They're very high pH, typically around 14, which is the limit of our ability to measure pH more or less. Um, the red color comes from the iron that's in the system. Um, these are pictures, uh, aerial pictures out of Jamaica. Okay. And the thing is, keep in mind that we're producing one ton of red mud per ton of aluminum produced. And that's a lot of material. And there's nothing that, there's no use for it. There have been a number of experiments and small projects done to say, can we make this material into brick, for example. Uh, but most of the time, uh, the costs are much too high to do that. So they sit. Uh, you may recall in Hungary, um, oh, about 10 years ago, there was a red mud, one of these dams that you see that, that contained this material failed, and the red mud came down the hill and uh, flooded into the Danube. It was um, uh, quite an environmental disaster. Um, <clears throat> so um, from uh, the aluminum oxide, we then go into aluminum metal production. This is, the, this is where a majority of the energy is spent. In the first half of this, you have the beneficiation process of extracting aluminum oxide from bauxite. A lot of energy goes into heating uh, the liquid. A lot of uh, uh, energy goes in to um, uh, basically extracting uh, the iron from that and plus the waste. When you get to this point, aluminum oxide goes into what's essentially a large electrolytic cell. And what you do is uh, you do what's called an... Um, uh, an electrolysis type of process where you literally strip the oxygen away from the aluminum oxide to make aluminum metal. Okay. And there is just immense amounts of energy in the form of electricity used to run this process. The picture on the right here is actually a series of these cells. Okay. That are bank, they're large banks. And what you get out of that is basically a liquid aluminum metal that then gets uh, taken to a furnace and cast into shapes uh, for use. Uh, these um, anodes, the carbon anodes, they wear out, they have to be replaced. You have a steel shell in the system that's cooled. Um, you have uh, this material coming in and they have to add things in such as um, cryolite, which is a fluorine uh, uh, material, and they have to add in carbon to facilitate this reaction. So it's incredibly energy intensive. <clears throat> Uh, at one point, you might be interested to know that aluminum metal was considered the most precious metal on the planet, I think 1930s, roughly. Uh, it is the very tip of the Washington Monument. The little uh, um, a pyramid at the top is actually pure aluminum metal. Um, it was considered so, it was so expensive, that was the most precious thing they could figure out to put on the top of the Washington Monument. So um, this process is so energy intensive that you see companies doing rather heroic things to reduce their energy costs. And the most, uh, the best example of that is Alcoa, uh, about 10 years ago, built a huge aluminum processing facility in Iceland because of geothermal power and they could get cheap electricity by comparison. Um, so recognize that they were willing to spend the cost to ship aluminum oxide to uh, Iceland to process it into aluminum metal and then ship aluminum metal out of Iceland all over the world. So the cost of shipping 
was overcome by the reduction in their energy costs um, for making um, aluminum metal. So you have sort of an idea of why this is such an energy intensive process. There are a number of steps involved. If you wanted to look at steel or iron, it's similar except that we don't have this carbothermal reduction. We have a carbothermal reduction instead of electrolytic reduction. So our energy costs are reduced because we can do most of these things chemically with high temperature in blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces and other things like that. And so the energy consumption requirements for making steel are smaller. Uh, you get some benefits by scale. And as you know, steel plants typically are immense. Uh, but in the end, you still have to strip oxygen away from the metal or to make the metal. So let's compare this to terracotta or clay production. Okay. Um, essentially, clay or shale or et cetera, whatever you use as raw materials mined, typically by strip mining. Uh, usually that material comes out of the ground. If it's clay, it doesn't need to be crushed. If it's shale, it needs to be crushed to a smaller particle. And then there may be additional beneficiation steps. Uh, that usually only include the separation of large particles or other impurities out of the system. Um, there are a number of uh, techniques that are used, and they're relatively uh, low cost. Okay, um, Clay applications, the largest application for clay in the country is actually coating paper for um, uh, to improve the color response on paper for printing. Um, and then outside of that, the ceramics aspect of it is probably 10% of the clay market in general. Uh, clay is also used for fillers and other things. They're all mined the same way. They're very inexpensive by comparison of materials. Okay. Um, what you beneficiate, what you get left over, if you will, the waste products though, actually can be used as another process or another purpose. Uh, sometimes, for example, um, in Florida, there's a mine that makes, um, uh, that generates clay and the clay deposits only about 10%. They separate out the clay the rest of that material is a sand, and that sand they sell to the glass industry to make glass, the clay they sell to the ceramic industry. So it's not that the material that comes out of the ground, there's very little bit of it as waste, but if it is waste, they stockpile it, and when they're done with the mine, they use it to refill the mine and reclaim the land. And, and uh, you can go online and look at uh, places in Kent, Tennessee and Kentucky and Georgia where they've reclaimed mines, and there are now you know, large lakes and fishing and, and recreational areas in particular. What they do for this process is they basically start by mapping the deposit. So this uh, picture up here in the upper left is actually a mapping of boreholes. Uh, so they'll go, uh, they'll drill boreholes, they'll take the samples out of the boreholes and they'll map the deposit. Uh, this area in the upper right in this image is this area here. And then the color regions that you see here are the regions that were open up, opened up and then mined. So you see void one, and this is, these are older slides, but from September of 98, void two was in November, void three was in March and April of 99, void four. So they're basically mining this deposit systematically, very um, uh, controlled and regulated manner where they pay attention to exactly what's, um, um, what they're looking for. And what they'll do is they'll take all this information out of boreholes and they'll actually put that information together and they'll develop a three-dimensional cross-sectional map of that deposit. And they'll know where they're going to mine to get the clay that they want. Uh, the bottom image shows you, the, the bottom of the bottom image shows you the map of the clay deposit. And then the upper image shows actually the cross-cut that shows how closely they match each other. So they map the deposit. Uh, they know what they're looking for. And then they go in and they mine. Okay, so it's a relatively efficient process, a much more efficient process than it used to be. Uh, now you have GPS sensors that are on the um, uh, the bucket, for example, or on the the um, uh, the shovel on a bulldozer, and they tell you where to go. Uh, where it used to be done by looking uh, at the color and the quality of material coming out, now it's all programmed in and very efficient. Okay, uh, the other thing is that um, you have overburden, which I'll show you an image of uh, the overburden. Um, <coughs> basically gets removed, gets set aside, and then they're into the clay. Um, actually, I don't have the overburden slides. These are some uh, pictures that uh, John provided. I imagine in the lower left, he's actually pointing to some small uh, outcrop green saying, I want that color for my terracotta. Um, but you can see the strata that's in the pit. Um, you see the water in the bottom of the pit, which is sort of an interesting story. Uh, if it rains, you don't mind. It's like a you know, multiple acre slip and slide, basically. Uh, so they mine the, the deposit. Uh, in this case, they're mining shale. And they're, they're also mining clay. And uh, you can see the color gradations within the material. 
and they know what they're looking for and uh, they mine specifically. After the clay is mined, then it is, um, <clears throat> it is mined and then stockpiled and then blended. Okay. And so the, you'll mine basically uh, certain seasons of the year. As I mentioned, you don't like to mine when it's raining. So we typically will close the mine during the rainy season. Uh, and then they mine the clay and they'll stockpile it. And then they blend the clay from different places in the deposit. And what that does is it provides you for uniformity. Okay, within a, a batch of clay or a lot of clay as it comes in the door, or it, but it also provides you consistency over time. So the clay that you get, um, you know, this year is going to be similar to the clay that you get next year. And so by doing that, they improve uh, their clients' process efficiency, uniformity. Uh, they allow them to be able to predict for variations in the clay as they come in the door. They often do quality control testing on the clays as they come in the door so they know where they're at. Uh, they work with the supplier, the clay manufacturer, the clay producer uh, to uh, establish criteria by which the clay comes in. And it makes this process very efficient, okay? It reduces waste because you'd really rather not make a piece, for example, that would crack coming out of the kiln and then you have to crush it back up and use it. Instead, you make that piece ideally first time, uh, first quality. So that uh, this process of mining the clay, stockpiling it, and blending it improves the process uniformity and process control within the manufacturer. <clears throat> so the next step after we have the clay, I skipped a step here, but um, it, is, it is important for the manufacturer that the clay is blended with other materials, um, feldspar, for example, other uh, raw materials, also with grog. The grog helps with the shrinkage and control shrinkage uniformity. Okay. Um, so that blending takes place in the factory at the manufacturer's site, and then that material is produced that goes into the forming process. And there are four primary forming processes that are used for making terracotta. How, and forming is how do you make the shape. So slip casting is the most, uh, you could argue one of the most labor intensive, but actually um, as process efficiencies improve and as the skill level improves of the, the um, factory uh, workers, the process becomes less uh, labor intensive. You work with the particle suspension, it's cast into a gypsum mold, the same material that's used to make wallboard, and you can make complex shapes with a lot of detail. Uh, the downside of that is you have typically higher shrinkage and slip casting materials, but it tends to be isotropic, meaning that it shrinks the same, direct, same amount in all directions. The second forming process is ram pressing. You could argue for a second being extrusion or ram pressing. In ram pressing, you have a plastic body uh, for making large reproducible objects, and they often have not as much detail. Uh, they might be uh, roof tiles, for example, or they might be um, uh, pieces for a facade where you have a lot of the same shape, and they're able to make relatively large pieces by ram pressing. And I have schematic examples and cartoons of these coming up. Typically lower shrinkage, typically highly uniform in the shrinkage, uh, less anisotropy. Extrusion is similar to that, but you have a plastic body, but now you're making a uniform cross-section. Uh, very high density is obtained in the green state often because of the pressures associated with extrusion. You get low shrinkage and you have a tendency to have more shrinkage uh, perpendicular to the extrusion direction due to alignment of the particles in the extruder. So you get less shrinkage along the axis and more shrinkage across the axis. At last, we have hand-forming uh, labor-intensive skilled workers. Um, complex shapes, the potential, there's a potential for non-uniformity, which the skilled worker and training tends to minimize. Potentially higher shrinkage, uh, usually more isotropic. Now I have a series of examples for uh, each of these. Uh, slip casting as a cartoon, if you will. Uh, here is a, um, a worker who's casting for this shape. You can see the inside surface of the mold. He's casting the suspension in what happens then so you cast it into mold in our little schematic here, and then water is absorbed into the surfaces of the mold and leaves the particles behind. When they get to the desired wall thickness, so they, may, they make these typically hollow, they can do solid castings as well, they're typically hollow, then they'll drain out the excess slurry, and that leaves you a wall of clay, basically. Okay, and then what happens is that that clay starts to dry, and as it dry, it shrinks a little bit, pulls away from that mold, and then you can demold. You can take the mold apart, and you lift out the piece that has sufficient strength to be handled. Okay, and basically, um, 
uh, longer times give you thicker uh, cross sections. Okay. Um, but <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of labor uh, associated with this, but you get the ability to make reproducible shapes that are very complex. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of work then and skill um, um, that's involved in actually making the molds uh, because you cannot have undercuts. You have to have um, um, systems designed with a draft angle so the mold can be removed easily so you can maintain the texture on your piece and the, and the detail. Uh, ram pressing, <clears throat> uh, remarkably simple uh, idea. You have two molds that are similar um, and they have a gap between them. And essentially you put a slug of clay down, the top piece comes down and squishes the clay and the clay then flows out to the edges, okay? And then you're left with that shape. The way the ram press works is that there are porous holes uh, throughout this. And in the gypsum, what it will do is they will inject air into the porous holes and that pushes the piece away from the mold surface. And they don't push air in the top initially, so they lift the piece out, attach the mold, and then they put a bat or some sort of um, piece underneath to hold it uh, with the fork truck, for example, shown here in the picture. And then they press uh, air or force air into the top mold and that releases the part, and then the part's allowed to dry. <clears throat> so it's a very simple conceptual, conceptually a very simple uh, system. <coughs> uh, extrusion, <coughs> um, Boston Valley is a master of extrusion basically. Um, you can see that this is a uniform cross section, not uh, necessarily simple. Um, and so uh, you have an auger type extruder or extrude extruder that's back here. And then that material, the, the clay is fed in through the top, uh, evacuated to take the air out and then it's forced into a chamber with the auger so it's continually pushing the clay in and then it goes into the die basically and comes out as a continuous cross section okay uh, that material comes off usually is cut with a wire uh, you might cut it a little longer than you need it to be and then you clean it up afterwards uh, but you end up with this shape in the end uh, the trick here for extrusion is having a plastic body that will hold its shape sufficiently during the extrusion process uh, but this is a very efficient way to form uh, uniform cross-section materials. And then lastly in our process we have hand forming operations. Um, so this <clears throat> this is a complex piece, okay. Uh, it would be too difficult to make by uh, extrusion because it's not a uniform cross-section, difficult to make by ram pressing. Uh, now a lot of these pieces are being made by uh, hand casting. The image on the left is an example of a hand formed piece uh, you know, the bust of, I guess, who it might be um, on the building uh, was basically formed and then additional sculpturing was done to match that, um, the shape that was desired. Okay, so hand forming is still a process being used. Um, the skill involved in hand forming is to avoid lamination type defects and other problems that can creep up later. Um, and I have to say that the process that they've developed at Boston Valley is, is excellent for that. They push the clay into the mold, uh, sometimes with pneumatic hammers, uh, but they are they work diligently to make sure that they get uniform compaction that gives them uniform shrinkage and also excellent durability in, in the process itself. After this is done, uh, they go through a drying step, which I didn't really go through, um, but then they go to heat treatment. So heat treatment is the process by which you basically force the ceramic particles to uh, grow back together, if you will. They form a liquid, which is a glass. Uh, that liquid basically contracts or pulls the particles together, eliminates pore space in the system, and you end up with low, um, low porosity in the end. I didn't have a picture of Boston Valley's kiln, an oversight on my part, but it's quite similar to this. Uh, basically, what you have is um, a kiln car with um, kiln furniture, setters, your piece is going here and then it gets inserted into the kiln and the door is closed um, and then the kiln is heated up. And then when you're done, uh, the kiln cools down and you pull it back out. So this is a, what's called a batch furnace or a periodic furnace, okay, or a kiln, okay, and then the pieces basically are stacked in here. Um, over the years, Boston Valley has developed, I think, uh, well-informed techniques for controlling behavior and firing to avoid problems that they run across uh, at times. Um, because of kiln mass. So a lot of material in the kiln. 
in the bottom here is a sort of an idea. It's it's a schematic, if you will. The temperature is not bad based on Boston Valley's temperature somewhere around 1100 degrees C is their peak temperature. So what happens is that um, you start at room temperature, you heat it up, and then there tends to be a little bit of a slowdown where you allow carbonates to decompose below 900 C. And then you continue up to your peak temperature and you'll hold there for a period of time. It might be several hours, depending. And then you cool back down. And then there's a slowdown in the quartz inversion temperature, which everyone believes is necessary, but actually it's not. And then you cool the rest of the way down to room temperature. Uh, you are typically okay to open the kiln somewhere around uh, just below 200 degrees C. Um, best practice is to let that be as cool as possible before you uh, open the kiln. This peak temperature that you see in the firing process, this is dictated by the material properties that you're looking for and by the composition of the body. And the material properties you're looking for are strength, freeze-thaw resistance, density, for example, open porosity, which contributes to freeze-thaw behavior. Okay, And you will design your firing temperature to match those properties in your material. Cycle times can range from hours. Okay, um, If you're making... Um, uh, ceramic tile, for example, like porcelain tile, uh, that firing time might be one hour from cold to cold. So this entire time on the x-axis is one hour. That's incredibly fast. Uh, and typically in what's called a continuous or a roller hearth kiln. But if it's big pieces like being made uh, for terracotta, sometimes those firing times can be several days. So you take it up slowly. And you take it up slowly because you have such a large amount of material to heat. And if you heat it quickly, the outsides get hot much earlier than the inside of the kiln, like the outside edges of the kiln get uh, hot fast. And then you get anisotropic shrinkage and other problems associated with firing. Plus on cooling, you have to take that heat back out. It takes time. So sometimes uh, cycles can range from three to four days, depending on the size of the pieces being made. <clears throat> what we're doing though, what is the goal? And the goal when we fire the piece is essentially to go from something like this. And then the left-hand side here is roughly the diameter of a hair. Okay, and um, you can see that this is a collection of particles. Highly porous, not well stuck together. And what we want to do is we want to fire in the process to go from this to essentially this middle image, if you will, uh, where you can see the large particles, which are grog, crushed up, previously used body usually. And you can see the clay matrix in between there, but you also see that there's very little porosity. There's a hole here, but this hole does not connect to the outside. So that's called a closed pore. And our goal is to have no open porosity. You don't want open porosity where water can get into the body and then the water, when it freezes, expands by 9% and then you crack the body. Okay. Um, so overall, this is an example in the lower uh, right here of Boston Valley. It's much uh, lower magnification, but you can see the uniformity of their microstructure. There's a couple spots of porosity which are not, in pro and not problematic because they are isolated steps and places of porosity. Also, the way that the material is loaded, which is typically in compression, those porous regions don't really make any difference. <clears throat> so a well-fired body has a microstructure similar to what you see in the center of the screen. It's very, very durable, and it's, um, um, uh, it gives terracotta its long-term durability and quality. Uh, in the previous talk, there was a question about how uh, this material might be, uh, today, how it would be superior to what was made uh, before. And I would have to um, uh, take a little bit of issue with that. If you think about the terracotta that's on these buildings, most of that material has been in place for over 100 years and is still doing its job. Yes, there have been some failures and there have been some problems, but by and large, most of that material has held up quite well uh, to the rigors of uh, environmental changes. Um, I'm not talking about global warming, I'm talking about seasonal changes to go from uh, snow to uh, heat um, and sometimes rapidly, uh, particularly here in Western New York. And those variations in temperature, humidity, moisture, et cetera, that material has held up very, very well. I do believe that the material being made today is superior in many ways. Um, the quality control is better, the uniformity of the process is better, uh, but essentially <coughs> um, this is a great material that's being produced now. So let's talk about carbon, let's talk about CO2 and the embedded carbon costs for terracotta or ceramics in general. So I'll give you three examples and then we're gonna compare them to metals and to other things. Uh, ceramics, glass, and cement, CO2 comes from two sources. It could be the burning of fossil fuels that it generates the heat in the process. And we can't ignore that there is a cost 
a CO2 cost to generate electricity, <coughs> with very few examples. You could argue for hydroelectric power to be CO2 free, uh, but there was a cost originally of actually building the hydroelectric dam uh, or the whole process by which we generate um, electricity. Uh, wind seems like a great idea, but there's a cost there of making windmills. So we're not out of the woods here in terms of the CO2 cost for making uh, electrical energy. From a raw material perspective, uh, we can get CO2 from raw material decomposition. If I think about the chemistry of glass, it's made out of silica, which is sand, um, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, and soda ash, which is sodium carbonate. Those two materials, calcium and sodium carbonate, both generate CO2 uh, from heat treatment. If I don't have calcium carbonate or sodium carbonate in my body, such as with terracotta, I don't have any CO2 to speak of as generated by the raw material. So there's no CO2 that comes from clay or sand or feldspar, only from these materials for glass. Okay, if I'm making cement, I have a mixture of silica sand and, uh, C and carbon, uh, calcium carbonate. So my CO2 comes from calcium carbonate then. <clears throat> so if I look at the three materials, ceramics, terracotta, and uh, ceramic and terracotta, and glass and cement, and I'm unable to separate the specifics of terracotta versus ceramic production, but the numbers are regional. Um, two gigatons per year for ceramics and, and about 0.1 gigatons per year of glass and two and a half gigatons of cement production per year. A uh, large amount of this um, ceramic production per year is in the form of brick. Okay. Uh, from a raw materials perspective, I get almost no CO2 from ceramics and from clay. I get about 150 kilograms per ton of glass produced that comes from the glass uh, raw materials and I get about 360, about 37% of my CO2 that's produced uh, comes, that's actually 37% of the raw material weight uh, that it comes off as CO2 from making cement. The energy costs associated with this based on temperature, uh, et cetera, uh, I have a roughly uh, 230 kilograms of CO2, 235 kilograms of CO2 per ton of ceramic produced, 450 roughly for glass and 630 uh, for um, uh, cement. When I add all that together, it costs me roughly a quarter of a ton of CO2 per ton of ceramic produced. So it's by far the lowest CO2 cost associated with manufacturing uh, building material. I get about twice that, a little more than twice that for glass, uh, where I'm at 0.6 um, uh, tons of CO2 produced per ton of glass. And my CO2 cost for making uh, cement is the greatest at one ton of CO2 produced per ton of cement produced. So it's expensive in terms of that. But it's not quite as expensive as we have for making metals. If I look at the energy associated, um, if I make energy and look at the CO2 cost, if I look at um, grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which seems like an odd thing, but we measure electricity in kilowatt hours and we look at how much CO2 is produced. It costs me roughly 0.5 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, so 500, kilo, uh, 500 uh, grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. When we look at the amount of energy required, electrical energy required to make aluminum metal, that works out to be about six and a half to seven kilograms of CO2 produced per kilogram of aluminum. So if I look back for a moment, my worst case for ceramics and cement is one to one, one ton of CO2 per ton of, of, of um, cement produced, or a quarter of a ton of CO2 per ton of ceramic or, or terracotta produced. I'm looking at six and a half to seven kilograms or six and a half to seven tons of CO2 produced per ton of aluminum produced. The plot on the right shows you that as we progress and as you see more hydroelectric power generation, et cetera, come online and other forms of renewable energy uh, for generating electricity, we see that we will slowly see a decrease in the amount of energy, CO2 produced, per, excuse me, per amount of energy produced, but we're still requiring um, a lot of CO2 per, uh, per energy, per uh, electricity. Um, to put all this in perspective, <coughs> and we have the same sort of chart as before, but now I've added the CO2 requirements, and you can see that uh, just as the simplest case, uh, I'm roughly 10 times more CO2 produced to make um, uh, plastics or stainless steel or, or copper, but I'm roughly um, 14 to 15 times as much CO2 produced to make aluminum than is to make cement, okay? 
And the reason for that, again, as we mentioned before, uh, is this aluminum production. Four kilograms of bauxite goes to two kilograms of aluminum oxide, goes to one kilogram of uh, aluminum metal. But with that, it comes a huge energy cost associated with that. So if I look at that in general, based on the numbers from the literature, which I've compiled here, terracotta requires the least amount of energy and generates the least amount of CO2 compared to any other building material, compared to cement or glass or anything else. It also has the potential for energy storage, allowing us uh, to reuse that energy from solar, for example. And how is energy stored in these materials and what would be best for storage? So I have a schematic of that, which I'm, um, it's relatively simple. A thermal energy storage uh, falls into a couple of different uh, categories, either thermal storage of energy or chemical. Um, and your chemical uh, storage issues are really sort of um, uh, like your air conditioning and heating costs, et cetera. Thermal, uh, we call it sensible heat, basically. And that's the thing that we're interested in. Um, how do we store energy in materials without having to specifically introduce energy, uh, such as, um, like if I do uh, latent heat, then I'm talking about how much energy we release by, say, uh, melting or solidifying a material versus um, just letting it sit there in the sun. So what we're looking at here is really sensible heat in liquids and solids uh, due to thermal um, excitations from the sun. Okay, so <clears throat> sensible heat storage then, what I have is, energy absorbed and then released, uh, completely reversible. There's an unlimited number of cycles. The amount of energy is called Q. And what I get is uh, V times rho is the mass. It's the volume times the density times a specific heat value times a change in temperature. So my change in temperature is generally relatively small under ambient conditions, right? Uh, you uh, come out of the morning and the terracotta is cold and by the afternoon it's warmed up. Well, what it's doing is it's picking up energy and it's absorbing that energy and it warms the terracotta. Then what happens is when you, um, um, when the sun goes down, that heat gets released back into the building. And, um, and that's the potential then for, for passive energy storage and release. <clears throat> so this issue that we have is uh, what is C sub P? Okay, what is specific heat and what does that mean to me in terms of these different materials? And so specific heat is actually... Um, a term used in chemistry and in thermodynamics. It is the uh, amount of heat or energy necessary to raise a body by a given um, amount, raise the temperature of a body by a given amount. So typically that is the amount of energy in joules uh, versus temperature in Kelvin or degree C. So specific heat capacity means that I'm gonna normalize that to mass. So if I have one kilogram of material, how much energy would it take to raise that kilogram of material by one degree? Typically, that's called a, um, a calorie, okay? A calorie is the amount of energy required to uh, raise uh, material to a given temperature. If you were in England, we would call it a British thermal unit or a BTU. That's the amount of energy ne necessary to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit, uh, and that's actually, you can see it's a lot of energy, uh, roughly 1,000 joules, okay? That'd be one BTU per degree Fahrenheit per pound, okay? <clears throat> So you see BTUs thrown around all the time. That has to do with how much energy is, is being consumed. So I have a table then of energy, um, a specific heat values for different materials. The most interesting thing about this chart is not going to be my comparison of aluminum and terracotta, but to the amount of specific heat necessary to increase the temperature of water. It's a huge amount of energy. <clears throat> it is four times as much energy required to warm water than it is to warm concrete, okay? Uh, if it was ice, it would only be half as much. So actually ice, ice requires less energy to raise the temperature than liquid water does. Liquid water, the uh, amount of energy required to dry materials, okay, such as uh, making plasterboard, as I mentioned earlier, or, or sheetrock, you have a huge energy cost for making that material. Most of that energy cost has to do with the evaporation of water. Now, if I look at this, I look at terracotta, its specific heat is 0.8 joules per Kelvin per degree per gram. Uh, and aluminum metal down here is about 0.9. So you would argue that actually aluminum metal has the ability to absorb heat a little better uh, than terracotta. So it takes a little more energy to warm uh, aluminum than it does to, uh, to warm terracotta but I would take you back a slide and point out, or two slides, 
that one of the things we're looking at here is the mass. So terracotta is typically heavy, which people don't really like, but in terms of energy storage, that's a huge benefit for us because the, your terracotta then being heavier with a larger mass will store more energy uh, than a thinner material, say of aluminum, okay, or a smaller mass of aluminum. The heat capacity differences are relatively small. But the thing is that you have a lot more terracotta in terms of mass and therefore better energy storage capabilities. Okay, <clears throat> so um, lastly, oh, I have a dead, my density is incorrect down here for aluminum, apologies. Okay, so this more or less wraps it up for me. Energy cost and environmental impact, metal production is incredibly energy intensive and carries with it immense environmental impact. Uh, the mining and beneficiation costs the, um, uh, the um, generation of waste materials is huge, and the ability to use those waste materials for something else is really limited. Terracotta has the lowest energy cost of any of the building materials to produce. It also has low environmental impact. Uh, you mine the material that's true, you process it, you have lower energy, lower CO2 emissions, and when you're done, if uh, you have a problem, you can crush it back up and put it back into the process. And the material that you produce in the mine that's not of use goes back in to fill the mine when you're done for reclamation. From an energy storage standpoint, you would argue that, that terracotta and aluminum are similar on a similar mass basis, but you have a lot more mass associated with terracotta and therefore greater potential for energy storage. Okay. <clears throat> I think that I have more or less got us back on time, more or less. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions, and you are happy to email me if you so desire. Bring it back to Bill, you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to take some questions. I'm just going to grab some questions from the chat. Uh, I think one question that uh, came up uh, that I thought was very uh, uh, prescient was, you know, just in terms of how you're, you're evaluating this uh, uh, in terms of just uh, tonnage. Well, in terms of uh, facade systems, for instance, the, the number of the amount of tons needed for a uh, aluminum facade versus a concrete facade for the terracotta is quite different. And perhaps those kinds of value equivalencies may be um, better to, 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 to do a comparison um, uh, than, than just tonnage. Um, I mean, that's, it's possible to go back and do that. Um, um, you know, if we keep in mind, though, the, the huge difference in um, energy, for example, and CO2 cost, you know, for aluminum versus terracotta, are we going to be um, in that factor of 100 uh, difference, for example? But uh, we can do that, uh, that sort of analysis. That's not that difficult to do. But you shouldn't use the density value that I posted to the table. That one's clearly wrong for aluminum. So mm -hmm. uh, another question that I'll just pull off here is uh, has to do with 3D printing ceramics uh, as an outgrowth of extrusion. Uh, do you see this as uh, uh, a possibility except uh, with uh, the viscosity is geared to the nozzle size, um, uh, the, the potential for 3D printing? There's a potential for 3D printing. Um, if you're doing an extrusion type 3D printing, where uh, like a robo casting type of process. There's a problem that, that comes up and, and the problem has to do with how the line that you're extruding bonds to the line that you extruded previously and together, right? So that where you have uh, that uh, surface that you form, then you form another material on top and how those two bond together uh, becomes actually critical to that process. And, and the issue is that as you're extruding, you're actually drying that material you know, in your conditions. So you have to tailor the properties of the extrusion body uh, to match the drying rate of that material below. So it becomes a little bit tricky, but I think it's feasible. Cement doesn't really have that problem if you do 3D printing of cement, and we've seen some of that being done uh, with the printing houses in the Netherlands, as I recall, uh, with 3D printing of cement. Uh, that, that's feasible. And the reason is that, that the cement reactions are much, much slower. Um, you need them to have some initial set to hold things in place, but the body between the layers seems to be less uh, critically dependent upon that rate of extrusion. One of the things that you give up with 3D printing uh, that may be problematic down the road, though, is the resolution and your ability to uh, print detail and, and structure into the material that you like. Um, there's powder bed 3D printers, mainly for smaller parts, although uh, some are larger, it can be done larger. 
Uh, there's some other photo, uh, like photo lithography processes that are very, very small parts. But for doing uh, cement, we looked at it for printing cement, uh, but the resolution isn't yet uh, available for printing fine detail in cement. So there's sort of a question about um, um, where that's going. I think it's, it's going to be something that we get to deal with in the future. I think it's going to continue um, uh, to be uh, of interest. I think there's still opportunities to be gained in doing 3D printing. Um, one other question here, um, uh, sorry, is a uh, um, little bit more of a technical question. Uh, uh, has there been much work produced on non-fire ceramic components through the addition of regis uh, regitizer, regitizers, such as colloidal silica or sodium silicate? Um, there's been quite a bit of that in terms of, of um, well, if you, if you take a step back and look at the investment casting industry, they use colloidal silica as a binder. And then uh, there's also a group that uses colloidal silica in a freeze casting operation. But almost all of those processes, um, they're followed by a heat treatment process. So the colloidal silica in and of itself usually is not sturdy enough to give a long-term solution to uh, bonding and give you the strength that you need. And you need a second step where you form those ceramic bonds or center that material together. Sodium silicate is used in glass casting molds, sand molds, for example. They set that with CO2, um, but they're intended to be temporary. They're not intended to have longevity. Uh, there's issues associated with uh, water attack and, and the stability of those materials over time. Um, so I, some of the other aspects of this, geopolymers are, are having showing more interest in terms of non-fired ceramics, but at the moment, we don't have systems that give us um, the properties of fired ceramics in a non-fired application. You can argue for cement, but we're not gaining anything um, uh, energy-wise by working with cement because it costs us more to produce it in the first place. Um, it's an interesting idea, and it's one that's been looked at, but um, it still appears that there needs to be this heat treatment process to improve the strength and the bonding of those materials before they go to the next stage or they're going to use. Uh, super. Uh, Bill, thank you so much uh, for this, this talk. There's a lot of uh, there are other questions, which is sort of package them and pass them on to you. I think they're, they, uh, uh, they're, they're very insightful.